Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. Now, before I tell you about my awesome guest, I want to tell you about my awesome contest. Now, this is a contest for the most meaningful iTunes review. So I need your help. I mean, in order to get the word out about the Heal Your Hunger Show, in order to help more people, in order to help people get the help and hope and healing they need with food and their struggles around that, I really need your help to get the word out. And the more reviews that we have that are meaningful and helpful to people, the better job we'll do of getting the word out. So you can really play a a major part in this. Now the contest uh, prize is going to be this amazing t-shirt I have. If you're watching, you can check it out. Uh, If you want to check it out later because you're listening on iTunes, uh, go to healyourhunger.com and click the link podcasts. So I'm wearing this amazing shirt that has blueberries on it and it says eat in peace. How cool is that? Eat in peace. Isn't that what we want to do? Well, when I saw these shirts, I just, I was so touched and I bought 10 of them. (laughs) So we're going to have this contest. um, But right now I'm giving away two t-shirts for the top two most meaningful full reviews. Now, what does meaningful review mean? It means you put some thought into it. It means you really uh, leave a five-star review um, and tell the viewers or listeners how the show has impacted you, what it is about the show that you particularly like, how has it particularly helped you, um, how is it different from other shows that are around health or food, uh, emotional eating perhaps. Uh, Really put some thought into the review. Leave it on iTunes. If you don't know how to do that, just Google how do you leave a review on iTunes and you can pull up a video on YouTube about it. But leave a review on iTunes and then copy and paste it into the Heal Your Hunger uh, Facebook page. So post it on the Heal Your Hunger uh, Facebook page and just say uh, my review uh, for the Heal Your Hunger show. And not only that, but then paste it in an email and write the email or address the email to reviews at healyourhunger.com. So this is a three-step process. I mean, you're going to write the review, you're going to copy and paste it to the Heal Your Hunger Facebook group, and then you're going to paste it in an email to reviews at healyourhunger.com so that we know who you are so that we can contact you if yours ends up being the most meaningful review. Now, it's two reviews that we're going to choose. So it's not just one chance, it's two chance. We're giving like two t-shirts. So please go and do that. Get get, get a chance to win this amazing t-shirt, Eat in Peace, with these just sweet blueberries on them. Um, I'm wearing it right now. I love it. It's super soft and comfy. Um, It's like a $35 t-shirt at Whole Foods. That's where I got it. So um, go ahead and do that. I thank you in advance. Uh, Even if you don't end up winning, it doesn't mean that uh, we don't love you. We appreciate you for leaving a review and that in and of itself um, is going to be a prize to somebody who reads it and is touched by the words that you wrote. So um, it's a win-win-win situation and um, I just thank you in advance for that. Now on to my guest. Margaret Floyd is the author of Eat Naked, Unprocessed, Unpolluted, and Undressed Eating for a Healthier, Sexier You. She's a beautiful soul inside and out. Um, She's also written the follow-up cookbook, The Naked Foods Cookbook, which was uh, put out by New Harbinger Publications in 2012. Um, She's currently uh, uh, putting out amazing information on her blog, Eat Naked Now. Uh, dot com. And she's just a lovely person. We had so much alignment and we believe so much uh, in, in a very aligned way about food and self-care and self-love. And so you're just going to love this show. Thanks so much for giving it a listen. All right, Margaret, so happy to have you here. This is a real joy for me. Oh, thank you. It's so fun to be here, Trisha. Yeah, this is great. And you do just amazing work. And I'm just really loving, you know, all that you're about and the help that you can offer people, especially here. Um, And and I just I want to hear about sort of how you evolved into the work that you're doing. 
Absolutely. So I have always, always loved food and for a long time was really unhealthy, but didn't realize it. Um, I had all sorts of like just things. It's funny. I think back to when I was in my teens and my twenties and even my early thirties before I, I, you know, I kind of came to this, uh, line of work a little bit later in life and all of these things that I considered normal. Um, I look back now and I think I can't believe I lived that way for so long. So I had chronic migraines. Um, I had really bad digestive issues where I would have to actually lie down after meals at least like four to five times a week because I was in so much pain, but I didn't think this was an issue, which is funny. Um, and, um, one of the biggest ones for me, particularly in my teens and my early twenties was I had a really bad case of eczema, like just anyone who's had eczema knows this just, you know, they describe it as like the, the itch that rashes and it's just like, you just want to go insane. It is so itchy. And I had been managing that with, you know, lots of cortisone cream. And I remember when I was, in, I was like 24, 25, and um, it got to the point where I was, it was all over my eyelids. I mean, it was everywhere in my body, but it was on my eyelids. And uh, the doctor I was working with was like, oh yeah, just put this cream on your eyelids. And there's something in me that was like, you know, I think that's too far. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to like melt my eyelids off. Like something just in me was like instinctively. And I never even heard of, you know, the natural healing world at all. You know, I grew up in a household. My mom had actually been dealing with some very serious chronic illness for many years. And she was absolutely all medical route. Um, and, you know, my diet at the time <laughs> was, you know, like, I mean, bagels and pasta. I was a vegetarian though, because so it was like low fat. I don't know that I actually ate vegetables, but I didn't eat meat. <laughs> um, I was a carbivore, basically. You know, I look back on it now. Lots of chocolate, lots of coffee, lots of wine, you know. And someone re recommended that I go to a naturopath. And I joked about it. Oh, we're going to take away all my favorite food groups, you know, coffee and wine. I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> I went in and she did a bunch of testing on me. And, yeah, I mean, if it was only the coffee and the wine and the chocolate that she'd taken on. I mean, everything just went upside down. Um, and I'm not going to say it wasn't hard work. It was really hard work. But in three weeks, that eczema that was like head to toe was gone wow. and it hasn't come back. Well, I, like, I have one little tiny patch that comes on my knuckle, this knuckle. And that's like my litmus test. Have I eaten something my body doesn't like? Have I not gotten enough sleep? Have I not gotten enough stretch? But it's just like this one like half inch by half inch patch as opposed to like you know, body wide. So it was such a profound uh, experience for me to see like, wow, what I eat has just like total um, impact on my health. Now it took me, you know, another 10 plus years to actually get into this field doing this work myself. But that was my first moment of like, wow, this really, this is really important. And it's, you know, it's, I mean, you, you say you are what you eat and like, yeah, we're like basically walking food, right? Like not a single cell or function in the body was not once food. So it's, it's important. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. And so talk to me about eat naked and how that's come about. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was, um, first practicing as a nutritional therapy practitioner, there's so many different food paradigms and so much confusion of this question of like what to eat. And I would coach clients through it and I'd see people literally be paralyzed in a grocery store trying to figure out what to eat. And so much of the food information that comes to us and nutrition information is really marketing. And that's, um, it's confusing to say the least. Um, and all these trends, you know, is it gluten free? Is it sugar free? Is it fat free? Is it this free? Is it that free? You know, like all these freeze and what does that actually mean? And what should it eat? So I was trying to just break it down to the absolute basics, which is let's just eat real food, you know? And so when I say eat naked, you know, first of all, obviously I'm talking about not talking about your clothes, although <laughs> Yes, if you decided to actually eat naked, you'd probably make some different decisions, but that's another story. Um, but, you know, it's really about stripping away the things that have been added to food that we don't need. So, you know, that list of ingredients on a annual processed foods, like what are those things? We don't need them. If you don't know what they are and you wouldn't like stock them in your pantry, then it's pretty likely that's not doing something good for your body. Um, and, uh, you know, the, all the, the packaging and the way the food has been grown originally. So all the pesticides and herbicides and, you know, if we just strip all of that away and get down to the basic, you know, real whole food, um, it is amazing the difference that that one change can make in your health. So that's why when I say eat naked, I'm just talking about unprocessed real food. Yep. So uh, in, in as few packages as possible, for sure. 
as simple as form as possible and as few packages as possible without a lot of stuff done to it, whether that's stuff done when it was grown, whether that's stuff done to it from the time it was grown to the time it gets, you know, into your grocery cart and onto your dinner table. You know, it's, it's, it's minimalist and it's, it's in, in many ways, it's very simple. Now it can sound complex because it's different from the way a lot of us are eating. And it's certainly when you walk into a grocery store, sadly, what's mostly in there is not actually real food and you know that's that's part of the challenge um but it it really you know once you've kind of made this switch um it's amazing how simple it it can be and how powerful it can be for you to actually sort of take charge of your health by taking charge of your dinner in a lot of ways you know you making the decision about what's on your plate and going into your body as opposed to um you know a food manufacturing company um i want to sort of unpack this a little bit because you know, you and I and being in the health field, we get unprocessed is better, but what does unprocessed mean? And, and actually more importantly, what does processing mean and why is it so bad for us? Right. Well, so food, when you're, when you're growing something, I'm just going to take an example of like a tomato. It's the first thing that top, popped into my head. So when you grow a tomato, that tomato, you know, the moment you pick it from the vine, it is like it's absolute nutrient, but most potential, right? Like there's, there's all sorts of good stuff and there are all sorts of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and it's like a superfood. So let's say that you, when it's growing, load it with all sorts of, you know, pesticides and stuff, you're going to be diminishing that nutrient quality already. Now let's say when you, once you harvest it, if you take that tomato and you run it through all sorts of processing, um, you're trying to add stabilizers to it, you're adding sugars to it, you're adding all sorts of things, and you turn that into a bottle of ketchup. There's a totally different, you know, you know, you sque- and I think we know instinctively that, you know, you squeeze the ketchup onto your plate. That's not the same thing as eating a fresh tomato. Um, but it's that same concept for, you know, any packaged food. So think of what has to happen to take something like the tomato that would go bad if you left it out for several weeks and turn that into, let's use another example, like tomato soup that's going to sit in a can and can have a shelf life of 10 to 15 years. Like what has to happen to that little tomato to make that a possibility? Um, It it depletes the nutrient content and it, it often adds all sorts of things to the food. And, you know, there's so many different um, chemicals and stabilizers and emulsifiers and all of these things that are designed to take that tomato, turn it into soup, but then make that soup last basically indefinitely. I mean, that's just, that's not the way, if you made soup and you stored it in your fridge, you know, in a few days, that soup's not going to be good to eat anymore. And that's the way it should work. Um, But once you add all of these artificial ingredients to it to stabilize it, um, that's that's adding all sorts of toxic ingredients that your body then has to figure out what to do with. Um, And of course, it's completely um, denaturing and and depleting the nutritional value of that tomato. And then that's when we go in and we add, you know, synthetic nutrients um, to boost up the nutritional value. So it's, you know, it's a little bit backwards that we've gotten to this point and there's you know a long history of why we've gotten to this point and you know it's not it's sort of intentional and corrupt and I don't think people are out to poison us that you know some people might believe that I don't think that's actually the case um, and yet yeah, let's you know let's go back to the tomato as opposed to the ketchup or the canned yeah. tomato soup that was awesome I appreciate your kind of playing that out because it does help the visual of it you know tomato versus ketchup making a squeeze noise out of a bottle (laughs) right totally like you know and I eat tomatoes like every day in my salads I go to the farmer's market every Sunday and I load up on lettuce and tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of stuff and I just I Uh love my fresh tomatoes so you picked a good very good analogy (laughs) absolutely that's great and so um let's talk also about um you know I mean we've talked about the additives we've talked about the processing versus the unprocessing but you're not talking about being a vegetarian when you say eat naked so no. uh, talk about naked meats and and proteins. yeah such a good question and there's so much confusion around this and I want to say straight up I was vegetarian as I said at the beginning not a very good one um for you know 10 15 years I kind of went in and out of it and there's different phases of that some healthier some not healthier but I really struggled with the idea of eating meat and that has actually been a really important part of my healing journey you know I realized my body really needed that so it's quite a personal decision but there's you know 
There's just a way there's different, you know, a tomato and, and uh, you know, ketchup are very different. Um, you know, I'll say like an egg is not an egg or even a piece of steak is not necessarily a piece of steak. So, you know, we started off this conversation, you know, we are what we eat. We're basically walking food. Well, so are the animals that we eat. So from all sorts of different perspectives, if you take, I'm just going to use the example of a cow. If you take a cow who's living on pasture, um, living outside, um, eating what that cow is biologically designed to eat, you have an entirely different situation than you do if you take that cow and you put it in a feedlot and you feed it corn and soy and stuff. These are things that are the, that cow is not biologically designed to eat. Incredibly stressful on its digestive system, um, and you know, so the pastured cow, you know, eating grass. Um, which is what we like to think of when we're thinking about eating eating beef. That that cow, the nutrient profile of that is actually closer to that of wild salmon. And most people just automatically know, oh, well, wild salmon, that's healthy for you. But they think, oh, having a steak is bad for you. Well, it's interesting because the fatty acid profile is very similar when that meat comes from a cow that is fed um, and raised properly. Yeah, Versus, not, not, just, not just fed grass, but is happy, like is not stressed out. Completely. Um, and there's also the environmental impact of that is totally different as well. You know, you have um, farmers who they think of themselves more as grass farmers because they're actually adding biodiversity and adding sort of bio, biological density back into the earth. We don't even, we, we don't think of that at all with industrial farming. We think of just depleting and sort of, you know, raping and pillaging the soil. And we see these, you know, I, I, you know, we talked about living in California. I remember driving up I-5 and there's some of those, um, factory farms that you pass you got to roll up the windows because the stench is so bad and you see these animals just packed in there's no green to be seen for miles um and they're just standing there in their own dung and it's just it's, it's, it's environmentally it's a disaster yeah um the nutritional profile of that food is horrible the quality of life for these poor animals is miserable um and so but that that doesn't that that's not necessarily how it has to be you know supporting a smaller scale farmer who's really doing it right ensuring that these animals have really happy healthy lives that they're thriving um you know that the farmer joel salatin as uh, you know some of you might have heard of him he always says you know these are animals who are living great lives with one bad day and let's face it we're all going to have one bad day yeah. um <laughs> and um you know it, it and it's part of how the world works. You know, um, something has to die in order for something to live. So, you know, there's an emotional component to it for sure. Um, I think we've moved so far away from eating or from from the relationship of growing animals for food ourselves. Unless you're a farmer, most people aren't out there butchering. So we have this, you know, it's, it's, it sounds and it can seem quite horrifying, but that's partly because we're so distanced from it. And also, you know, our relations with the animals is like, you know, sort of Disney-ified, right? You know, we think of these things as having Person, you know, you know, a Disney kind of comic type of personality, um, and um, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the value of these animals' lives in any way, shape, or form. And I think actually a really important piece can actually be, you know, at dinner sitting down and honoring the animal and thanking, you know, people who say grace, whether it's you know spiritual and religious connotations or just taking a moment to be grateful and honoring and thanking that animal for uh, giving their life to, to sustain you. Um, it's, um, it's, it's such a, it's a complicated topic. It's an emotionally challenged, a, a challenging topic. Um, but it's really important to know that um, you can eat animal proteins in a way that is good for you, that is honoring that animal, that is not buying into animal cruelty, and that's actually good for the environment. And that's it's a very different way of thinking about this than most people do. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, let's transition into talking about implementation because mm -hmm. um, these are amazing concepts, but for the busy people, you know, listening who are running here and there and everywhere and it, they can barely, you know, cook food or put food on the table. They're, they're yeah, usually, right. you know, running to the grocery store and getting prepackaged foods just because they're stressed out and they don't have time. Mm -hmm. How do we transition and, and get them into this naked eating lifestyle? 100%. It's such an important piece of it because we can give the best advice in the world and it's like if you can't actually do it. Uh, What's the, what's the point of it? So I think what's really important here is to acknowledge, first of all, that it does 
require changing your, it, it does require change. It doesn't necessarily take more time. It's about doing things differently. So even back to just the tomato example, since we've got a tomato theme going on here, it doesn't actually take that much more time to chop a tomato in a couple of slices than it does to like open up a can of soup. Now, obviously you're getting just fresh tomato as opposed to soup, but it, it, we have this idea that eating real food is very complicated and really hard. So what I would suggest is to, to start with is finding some really simple recipes um, and it just you know, I, I'm a big believer in planning. Um, I am I am so busy. People think that because this is my line of work, I spend hours in the kitchen. If I've spent more than 10 to 15 minutes making dinner, to me, that is like way too much time. Good to way know. too much time. Good to know. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer in being really efficient with, with things. Um, and so, you know, there's different strategies around meal planning, but I think taking the time at, at some point, I like to do this on the weekend, um, taking the time to just think out what you're going to be eating for the week. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Now, of course, the first few times that you do this, it'll take a little bit more time, but picking out a few key meals. And even if you want to just start with baby steps, if you're eating packaged food every night, or if you're eating out or doing takeout, maybe start with like one meal a week and say, okay, on Tuesday nights, we're going to eat dinner that we cook ourselves and pick a recipe and make sure you have the ingredients for it. And then you've, you've taken care of Tuesday. So a big part of it is the mental piece, right? Like you don't want to have to be thinking about, you know, if you have on the weekend figured out what you're going to eat on Tuesday night, you've got the groceries for it and you got the recipe for it. Um, that means that when you come home from work on Tuesday and you're tired and the kids are like being pulling you in 18 million directions, um, that you're not opening up the fridge and then thinking, what am I going to have for dinner? I thought I was going to cook for myself, but I'm way too tired and I have no idea and I don't even, uh, you know, it's so a little bit of forethought and setting yourself up for success can go a really, really long way. Um, and, um, I want to just actually share one concept that I've been playing with a lot in my life, and I've been working with this with clients recently. One of the things that um, I think can be really helpful is identifying for yourself um, what I call the, your linchpin. So it's that one thing in your life that has a huge trickle down effect. It kind of can orchestrate all the different pieces together and it will either spin you in a really positive direction or spin you in a really negative direction. Um, and it's different for all of us. I'm gonna share you the one for me. For me, it's sleep. If, I have, if I'm well rested and I get to bed on time and I get a good night's sleep, then all of the other pieces fall into place. I wake up rested, I do my meditation, I'll probably make it to the gym because I'm not like hitting snooze 18 different times. Um, and if I've hit it to the gym, then I'm much more likely to feed myself a better breakfast. And you get the idea, yeah. right? Whereas if I haven't slept, you know, I am a, a mom of a 15 month old and a five year old. So this is why sleep is probably my linchpin might not be for everybody's. But if I haven't slept, the trickle down effects are massive. I probably won't meditate. I'm likely not going to make it to the gym or if I do, I'm going to be exhausted, have a bad workout. I'm likely to just be rushing. I'm irritable with my kids. I'm not as effective at work, you know, like all of the things. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a bigger picture concept, but I just encourage people listening to this to, to take some time to think about what is, what is your linchpin in this? Because sometimes it's one thing that if you can change that one thing, it will have huge impacts on all of the other pieces that you know, because in many cases, we know what to do, but we don't do it. And why? And there's lots of psychology underneath that. But I think often there's something that's kind of sabotaging the process. So I encourage people to like really think, I mean, maybe it's maybe it's the sleep piece. Maybe it's the food piece. Maybe it's planning. You know, it's going to be different for every person. But just take some time. And, and if you watch kind of in your life, if there's that one thing that if it's in place, everything else goes smoothly. Or if it's out of place, everything kind of goes haywire. Start with that thing. I don't know what it is for you, but start with that and it will make a world of difference. I love that. And I think sleep could be just about everybody's linchpin. <laughs> I think it, I, I, you know, I'm so biased with it right now. Um, I think it probably is, but, um, yeah. but it can be other things. You know, sometimes the sleep is a result of other things in the day, you know? Yeah, no, that's such a, that's a great action step. So that will definitely be, you know, action step number one, I think is identify your linchpin. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Um, talk to me about 
um, besides the implementing, you know, doing the linchpin, what are some other things like, like you've said in the past, and I just love this, is that it's not a clean transition, it's a messy transition. So talk to me about that. It isn't, you know, I think, you know, we, we get into this trap of you see photos, you know, these beautifully done photos on Instagram of either like someone's perfect dinner or perfect body or, you know, and they just seem like they've got it so together and um, it's just not the truth in so many <laughs> cases, you know, um, it's funny in my book, Eat Naked, <laughs> The chapter that people often tell me, oh my gosh, I loved it the most, is I have a chapter at the end called When Not to Eat Naked. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin the surprise here for you if you want to read the book. But I share um, what, uh, you know, my, I'm a full believer, as I've shared, in real food. And my secret, like, crutch and the thing that I crave when I, like, whether there's emotional stuff going on or I'm stressed or whatever, is macaroni and cheese. And I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> good macaroni and cheese. I'm talking about the, like, fluorescent orange powder out of a box, you know? And, like, don't mess with me if I'm eating that because it's just like, nah, this is my box. And, like, you know, so, um, so I think it's so important to recognize that there, you know, there can be tension in this and it's going to be, you know, in many ways, the transition is about getting back on the wagon just again and again and again. And I always say, like, you know, we have this idea, you know, I have a, I wrote a post called Why Wait Until Monday? We have this idea of, like, oh, I fell off the wagon. I, I had Here a Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so that means my weekend shot, and that means for the rest of the week. So I'm going to just wait, and I'm going to start Monday. No. Start a dinner. Okay, so you had – you you had a made a choice at lunch because for whatever reason who, okay that's great who cares you needed it in the moment now let's move on what's the choice that you can make next it's and so good I love that it, it's and that and that's the reality for all of us you know and I even you know even someone who is the you know the most chiseled and sort of perfect looking and apparently perfectly eating and all of that like we have. It's so important to remember that food is about so much more than just fuel and nutrients, right? It is. It's social. It's nourishment. It's distraction. It's comfort. Uh, it, it's so many things. And to pretend that it's not is um, is not doing you any. It's not doing you a service. So acknowledging that it can be these things, and that sometimes at different times there's going to be something that trumps the you know that the health aspect. Yeah. I think what's really important is what are you doing generally. And what's the what's the rule and what's the exception? Yeah. And over time, we want to switch it so that the rule is the healthy, naked eating. Yeah. The exception is the you know is the indulgence, is the <laughs> macaroni and cheese or whatever it is. Um, and and that's okay. Those two things can coexist. It's just about kind of switching the balance. And you're gonna fall off the wagon. I fall off the wagon. You know, yeah. it, it's. It, 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 we just it's it's okay you're, yeah you're, well you're human it, it's such a beautiful lesson because uh you know the black and white thinking of the emotional eater especially you know, the people i i uh speak to is you know so debilitating because people are just like if i can't do it perfect i'm not doing it at all right you know, totally. and, and it, that goes for meditation. I mean, people never, you know, they never start meditating because they're like, but my mind's too busy. It's like, well, it's supposed to be busy. Like, that's, that's why we meditate, you know? And so it's just cutting ourselves some slack and just realizing yeah. I love the progress, not perfection statement, because it's just really, that is what it's about. And like you said, you just, over time, it does flip where the healthy days yeah. outweigh the unhealthy days, you know, but there's no percentages and, you know, beating on ourselves for not being perfect because nobody is perfect, it, and it, I, I'm certainly not. So that's just beautiful. I love that, and I just love the way you're you're phrasing these things and really, uh, you know, uh, framing them is, is really what I meant to say. So it's just beautiful, and I really appreciate you. And, and you actually walk people through this process of transition to eating naked. I do. I do all the time. Um, in fact, we've got a new detox program mm -hmm. um, called the Naked Foods Detox where we're really doing this and just – in a sort of concerted 14-day program, we're teaching you how to how to transition. Um, and uh, sometimes some of these foods too. It's when we talk about the processing and all of those um, artificial synthetic ingredients that are going in there. Let's not forget that part of what they're doing is manipulating your taste buds and making you want 
more of that food? You know, is their job keeping you healthy or is their job to sell more of whatever it is? Their job is to sell more of whatever it is. And the more they can make it craveable and make you like really want it. And there's chemical ways they can do that. Like, yeah. that's, you know, um, and so shifting away from a more processed foods diet to a real foods diet, there can be a transition. And we like to just, you know, give it a good, um, you know, we, you know, kind of like a chiropractic adjustment for your, for your sugar handling and for your taste buds. Um, we do this over the course of 14 days and give you a crash course and the, the meal plans and, and some of the simple recipes that we use in our household all the time. Great as well. I just want to say for, but for kids, you know, sometimes we get into this idea that, oh, like, oh, mom's on a diet or, you know, uh, uh-uh, forget it. Like there's nothing that I teach that you can't do and that won't benefit the whole family. And in fact, this 14 day, uh, naked foods detox is something that is ideal to do as a family, get everybody, you know, there's, there's nothing in there that we take out that is that is necessary for your health um, and everybody can benefit from it so I love that and when you say we you're talking about you and your husband yes I I'm married strategically um, <laughs> my husband is um, yeah he's a chef he uh, is a celebrity chef he used to cook for a lot of the big a-listers in LA when we lived there and he is the master of um, of cook making I mean he can make just about anything taste um, amazing but he can you know we work with a lot of people with very special diets and he's able to fake it you know something that you might love that you're not that it might be a processed food how can you actually reproduce that in a real food way that's simple that satisfies that same kind of need you know this weekend we had friends over for dinner and he made this you know he calls it his faux Kentucky fried chicken because that was one of the things he grew up on that he loved um, but clearly we're not eating Kentucky fried chicken anymore so um, but he made these chicken tender things and I was I mean it was just like are you kidding me they were so good and they satisfied all the things um, and they were paleo and they were you know of course the chicken was very very clean healthy pasture raised chicken so yeah totally different experience so anyways he he's um, he partners with me and we we share all of these um, recipes and uh, uh, he's pretty passionate about this as well and that's uh, beautiful I love that <laughs> I love that you're doing it as a team that's just uh, that's just extra special so I always ask my guests Asked a parting question and you can take mm-hmm. a few seconds to answer and that is what is your deepest hunger my deepest hunger it's a good question you know I'm just gonna answer with what comes to me first and I would say my deepest hunger is for connection, um, like real connection, you know, not the niceties, um, but just that like heart to heart seeing and being with each other. Um, I crave that and I miss it and I find myself distracting myself from it with, you know, my phone or busyness or whatever. But I would say that is for me with my kids, my husband, with, you know, friends, you know, even in contexts like this, just like that real, that real person to person connection. Cause you know, for me, that's what it's all about. I love that. That's actually one of the set steps in my seven simple steps oh. in emotional eating is connection and community. Cause I love it. without it, we're, we can't do it. You know, we've got to be connected at the heart level with other people. Totally. So love that. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. It has been such an incredible pleasure to have you here today. So I really appreciate you. And I just appreciate all the work that you're doing in the world to help people transition to real, live, naked eating. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Risha. So great. Love the work that you're doing. It's such such an important piece of, of this puzzle, such an important piece that isn't discussed enough. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. If you enjoyed this show and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.